Thank you all for coming to uh, this week's Brown Bag Lecture. We're fortunate to have uh, a special program today. Um, we'll start with Paul Monson, who is the current president of the Utah chapter of the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art. He will talk about that institution briefly. He will introduce our main speaker today, Robert Barrett from Historical Arts and Casting. Uh, Robert will talk about the restoration of the CCMI facade, cast iron facade, that launched a career that's traversed this amazing art with his touchdown most recently at the Capitol Dome in Washington, D.C. So we're very privileged to have Robert speak to us today. So, uh, without any further ado, um, I'll turn the time over to Paul and let him proceed. Thank you, Don. Is this working? Yeah. No? Nothing works. Okay. <laughs> I'll just... If you can't hear me, just raise your hand. Oh, there we go. I am very grateful to be here today. Welcome, everyone. Uh, Robert Baird has been restoring historic buildings since he was a boy working with his brothers out of their garage to figure out how to do cast metal preservation on their father's projects. To quote Robert, my father, Stephen T. Baird, was one of the early preservation architects in America. He was commissioned to restore an old historic Mormon community in Illinois called Nauvoo. Our family moved there when I was 11 years old and I grew up in a preservation environment. In the summers, I worked with archeologists where I was lowered into wells to excavate and bring up artifacts for the archaeology research of these historic buildings. Robert now helps to run one of the premier metalworking companies in America, Historical Arts and Castings, which is based right here in Utah. It's a little known fact that Utah is the center of the universe for metal uh, restoration work. And that's largely thanks to Robert's work over his career. Robert also has a parallel life in the nonprofit world, both in humanitarian work and in promoting preservation and classical architecture. He founded the Utah chapter of the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art, the ICAA, which trains designers and artists in the classical tradition. As the current president of the ICAA, in Utah, I am delighted to carry on that legacy that Robert has left us. Our mission is to preserve not just old buildings, but a living tradition. We need people today who can do traditional masonry, plaster moldings, true style and rail doors, wood windows, cast iron work, all these trades that created the beautiful buildings we love around us need to be passed on. To, ne to the next generations. Architecture and fine arts schools have abandoned this tradition and the ICAA helps to fill the gap. Please put your name and email on the sign up sheet that's going around and we'll keep you updated on our events and programs. Next year, for example, we will be hosting the traditional artisan series, monthly hands-on workshops that teach these historic building trades like lime plaster and ornamental metal. One event this year you don't want to miss is the Utah Classical Arts Gala, a dinner and celebration on June 23rd. And there's a flyer going around about that. Visit classicistutah.org to register for that or leave or to learn more about the ICAA. That's classicistutah.org. I'd like to express my gratitude to the Utah Division of State History and all of our public servants. And that has a better ring to it than politicians. All of our public servants who are leaders in supporting the arts and our history. I cannot begin to tell you what a legacy Robert has left us. Everywhere I go, just saying the name Robert Baird opens doors, brings a smile of recognition to someone's face, and inspires people. He is one of the finest educators, craftsmen, and visionaries that I know. Well, that was a real kind introduction. Um, I don't uh, really believe that, I do believe that the center of the universe for preservation is here in Utah because I've been here my whole life. 
Um, we live in a great place and there's been some amazing things that have happened here over the years. Uh, I'm really honored to have the opportunity to speak to you a little bit today about um, my experience in preservation and uh, how work in Utah is actually affecting preservation across America. Most people don't realize the impact that Utah has had in not only the arts community, uh, but also the preservation community across America. Um, I believe that we're all connected by a red thread. There's a Chinese proverb that talks about a red thread that connects people and places and time. And we are all connected. And I'm sure that if we had enough time today, we would all find a connection with each other. I hope that in the few minutes that I get to uh, spend time with you, that you might be able to um, discover or share with me how we are actually connected. I was blessed to be raised in a family that was a preservation family. My father, uh, ironically, um, uh, wanted to pursue a career in architecture and um, was accepted with a full ride scholarship to Columbia University. Um, at the time, he actually got a, a mission call from the church and ended up going to France and um, had an amazing experience there. But when he, when he came home, he discovered that his scholarship was gone, but that the University of Utah had started an architecture program and he was one of the early students in that, in that uh, school of architecture. Um, my dad uh, was an amazing figure for uh, my brothers and I and all of our family. And um, in his pursuit of architecture, he wanted to kill the world with modernism. He was a huge fan of Frank Lloyd Wright. And uh, he studied Frank Lloyd Wright. He read all of his books. He designed buildings just like Frank Lloyd Wright designed and was passionate about that. But in the early 60s, he had the opportunity to um, go to Illinois and uh, work on the restoration of Nauvoo, which was this old historical community. That experience in Nauvoo changed his life and the direction of his career. He spent the rest of his career preserving old buildings. But in that red thread through his life and his desire to be involved in modernist architecture, at the end of his career, he got a call by one of the most famous modern architects alive in America, Philip Johnson. Philip Johnson had seen some of my dad's work on historical buildings and discovered what he'd learned about cast iron. And Philip asked my dad if he would design all of the classical and traditional ornament for these new modern buildings that he was designing. So in the full circle of his career, uh, he started as an as a architect with a desire to do um, modernism, spent an entire career doing historic preservation, and then ended up working on some of the great modern buildings in America. And um, he left an incredible legacy. Um, in the early 1970s, uh, uh, he was commissioned to work on ZCMI. And we're going to show a video before I spend much time really talking about uh, what happened. But as you see the video, you, you'll learn about uh, that project and how it influenced America. But the important piece of the video is not necessarily the project in itself, but it's the story about how a community can impact their environment. I saw a movie yesterday flying from Maine to Salt Lake called Collateral Beauty. And um, it's an interesting film because um, it, it talks about, or, or it doesn't really talk about, but you begin to realize how we can affect what happens around us and the beauty that's around us. We are surrounded by an incredible history and um, we can impact that. We can make that history known. 
and I, uh, I'm sure that all of us share a connection with preservation and history here. And um, in a relatively new country in the world, there's a lot of work to be done to preserve our heritage and our culture. Anyway, what I'd like to do is play this video, and uh, it's about 22 minutes, and uh, then uh, uh, I'll share a few thoughts with you, and then you can ask any questions that you might have. save an important architectural icon like the facade of ZCMI. We live in a throwaway society, so we think, uh, you know, we're, we're tired of that, it's old, let's throw it away. And, of course, it was cast in cast iron, which is, it rusts away and, and deteriorates, and why should we save it? The cast iron facade is the essence of the ZCMI building. What happens behind the facade can come and go. The old building can be torn down, a new one can be put in its place, but the cast iron facade, that's what you keep. If we can save some of those art treasures of our short past, and let that continue to influence uh, how we think and how we create things today, I think that's a good thing. People love this type of architecture. These buildings remind people of their childhood in the good old days and the memories that they had growing up in Salt Lake City, being around ZCMIs when they were children, going shopping there with their parents and their grandparents. I have a friend, Joanne Copeland, who, who loves ZCMI. When I said, well, I, I don't know if they're going to put the facade back up again, she said they've got to put the facade back up again because it's a part of our lives and it's a part of our heritage. Great works of art really are immortal. They go from one generation to the next and they live on and and help us appreciate what, what has come before and inspires and uplifts. That's really the purpose of art, isn't it? To inspire and uplift and to present something that will show people of their possibilities and motivate them to want to do better. And, and, uh, uh, and I think we need, especially in today's world, we need more and more of that. CMI got started in the winter of 1868-1869. One of the concerns the Mormon people had under their leader Brigham Young was that people were bringing in products into the, uh, the territory for sale and really jacking the prices up. Brigham Young said, why don't we become our own merchants? And so they started Zion's Cooperative Mercantile Institution. ZCMI, when it was first conceived and organized, was really a network of cooperatives that existed all throughout the Great Basin Kingdom. 
And it was a great equalizer. It made it possible for uh, a family down in Santa Quin, Utah, to have the same quality of state's goods that were shipped in from across the country as someone who lived in Salt Lake City. And Brigham Young, when he talked about that, he talked about CCMI as the people's store because it united the LDS community and gave um, this, this uh, equal access to wonderful things. ZCMI had the respect and the love of the whole community. It was their store. It was their, it was their ZCMI. You didn't just like ZCMI. You loved it. It was a part of your heart. And they sold everything from overalls to produce to wagons to buttons and fabric. It really was America's first department store. I think we can, with certainty, claim that CCMI was America's first department store because of the way it was organized. When Brigham Young met with a, a group of some of the most prominent um, owners of businesses in town and they decided that they would join together and create this sort of collective enterprise, they were essentially bringing a series of departments into this new organization. And it was earlier than the earliest department stores. ZCMI was right when they said it's an institution because ZCMI was definitely an institution. Uh, one that uh, built character, honesty and integrity. You couldn't separate the church from the business. It was the greatest formula that ever happened. There's thousands of stories about ZCMI because there's been thousands of different wonderful experiences that have been had by the by just the common ordinary person. The generation that built that and got it up and running was a group that did the very best they could with what they had. They brought cast iron, which was a really an unknown process, to Salt Lake in 1869. People would come from all over just to look at the windows. The cast iron process began in New York with the Bogardus building. It was a kind of an erector set type of process. Up to that time, buildings, the structure was heavy timber, maybe four or five stories at the most, and brick or stone bearing walls. Bogardus was the pioneer of cast iron architecture in the sense of multi-story, uh, com particularly commercial buildings, the ones that spread across the United States. The architecture that was in a way invented just at the right moment when the United States was expanding and was spreading west. It was an invention whose time had come. And soon, cast iron buildings were popping up all over. After the Civil War, you could send cast iron components on a train all the way to Salt Lake City. And that's what happened. When I heard that they were going to tear down ZCMI, we didn't believe it. The first department store in the world is going to close it out now? I mean, no, that, that, somebody's got it wrong. I don't know who, who's telling that story, but it's not a true story. It was a feeling of devastation. Normally, a new piece of construction comes along, and the architects want to throw all the old away and put their statement in. But somehow they, they decided to build a new building, but save the old original facade. In 1971, when the decision was made to build the new mall, 
The decision was also made to demolish the ZCMI building uh, wholly. Well, Utah Heritage Foundation and the other partners who wanted to preserve this important place got together and said, what can we do to save it? You know, a lot of people really can't pencil the, the value to res restoration and just think it's cheaper and more economical to tear down and build from new. And um, my experience has been that it's a hard argument to make because once something's gone, it's gone. And people don't remember what they've lost. An advisory member for Utah Heritage Foundation decided that he would write a letter to the editor of the Salt Lake Tribune and advise people that the only effective course of action at this point to save the facade would be to cancel your charge accounts at ZCMI if they were going to demolish the facade. Well, that's what happened. A flood of letters came in, many of them with cut up credit cards. So people speaking with their wallet really made the difference in saving the facade. It's like any decision you have to make in terms of curating what stands the test of time, whether it's a good song or a musical or a, a movie or a book. Um, somebody has to be looking out for the um, ar architectural integrity of our, of our human journey. And, um, and so standing up for that, I think, requires people who understand history, who understand architecture, who understand design, but also understand what's happened in those buildings, you know, the, the stories. Um, because I, I'm a big believer that you're always standing on somebody else's shoulders. You're always building on, you know, the greatness of somebody else. And that's certainly true for buildings and, and great homes. I first heard about ZCMI when my mother said I'm going to Salt Lake City. She said I'm going to Salt Lake City because there is an important cast iron building in that place built back in 1869 by the Mormons who erected it as a commercial establishment. She'd heard about an architect who was working to restore this building in a way that is in keeping with its historical character. The man that she was talking about was Stephen Baird, and I know that she several times visited Salt Lake City. I think that they both saw themselves as early pioneers in this process of finding a practical way to restore cast iron buildings. My father was trying to discover how this type of building assembly was put together. And so we very carefully took pieces apart and cleaned them up using paint stripper and wire brushes until we could uh, figure out how to put them back together again. Those columns were all done in little tiny pieces and bolted together. So he had to take the paint off, I don't know how many layers, 14 layers of paint, had to be taken off so that he could get down to the bolts and find out how the thing was put together. This was the answer to how you could preserve cast iron buildings at a time when the purpose for which they were originally built had passed. And I gather that Stephen Baird really had to work step by step and solve problems as he went along. When I think of my dad, I think of an amazing artist. He had this amazing creative ability to find out about a project and then figure out how it worked and then translate that into drawings, but also inspire all of the craftsmen and all of the workmen surrounding that project 
to work at their highest level. His commitment was to creating a project that in the end would be the best that it could be. He was an eternal optimist. Uh, if he didn't know it, he would find out how to do it. He knew where he wanted to go and, and what it wanted to be like, uh, and he would find his way to that goal somehow. And it was really on a shoestring budget. We were just working out of our family garage. When we had inspections from various people, my dad would go out and rent this, rent a building for a day, hang a sign on the front of it, and then I would take all the little bits of equipment that I had down there, my drill press and hand tools, and spread them out to make them look like I'd worked a long time in that shop. As they finished their inspection, I would clear up the tools, take the sign off the building, go back to our family garage. It was such a rinky-dinky outfit. The main tool they had was was a Kirby vacuum cleaner that the boy's mother had bought, thinking that it was going to be used vacuuming the house. It was one of those whiz-bang concoctions. It had a paint sprayer attachment. It had a, a Dremel tool, a flexible head, so you could attach uh, disc sanders and, 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 and all, all manner of grinders. They reconditioned every part. In fact, I think they recast most of the parts and then applied it to this new building. And I thought the end result was just uh, really terrific. It is actually one of the most significant buildings in America in the story of uh, preserving and restoring architectural cast iron. I think that the ZCMI building is almost like Bogart is building his first cast iron building, the Milau Pharmacy. It proved that one could do this. It proved that you could take it apart, clean it up, improve it, recast places, and re erect a building. Well, the ZCMI facade influenced restoration in the United States of America, clear across the country. Buildings have been restored because of what my father discovered. When I heard of this new construction going in again, I thought, well, here goes the ZCMI's old facade. I was quite alarmed when I visited Salt Lake City to see ZCMI wasn't there anymore. And I called up Robert. I said, Robert, where did ZCMI go? I know it was your, it was your first big project. And he said, never fear. It's been carefully disassembled and will be rebuilt as part of a new development. The ZCMI's facade, or the new Macy's facade now, is a cast iron facade that consists of about 63 bays, which initially were window openings and entrance openings. And the structure is a series of colonnades that have arched heads and pediments where windows were enclosed in each of those openings. My mother, she would have, I think, appreciated it immensely because it does what she so liked to do, find a good practical way, a way to use something and then use all of the advantages we have of modern techniques and abilities and find a way to save things by making them useful. Brigham Young was particularly infatuated with British architecture. I can't help but think as I look at those lions on the facade that this is a little bit of Great Britain that Brigham is bringing with him. It was a way of saying, we're here to stay. And this institution is going to be around a while. Good architecture is one way of saying permanence. 
and the uh, the cast iron facade of Zisiumai has uh, has become a statement of the permanence of the uh, of a vital downtown core in one of America's uh, significant cities. I think Brigham Young, first of all, conceptualized Salt Lake City as this sort of cooperative environment, a, a community. But very quickly, and, and within just four or five years, he started thinking about what you might call the genteel city, or a city that really met the cultural standard of other cities. And I think in, in that era, mid-19th century, one of the cultural icons of a great American city was the cast iron facade. And I think that that was really part of his design of, of building a city that was um, more comparable to cities elsewhere. I think that, in a nutshell, uh, shows the importance that people attach to cast iron, that you know, it's worthwhile for a developer to carefully disassemble a cast iron facade, uh, put it aside, restore it, and re-erect it, because it is a non-reproducible architectural resource. The facade initially is constructed of thousands of components that are assembled in little pieces that make a large part like a column or with column capitals that may have 20 or 30 pieces. And so we at Historical Arts spend a great deal of time in removing old finishes that were on the facade, the old fillers, uh, get the material down to a bare metal where we will repair the component, then put new finishes on that have uh, a greater longevity. Gradually, historic arts and castings was brought together so that these craftsmen and these artists could come together and make these bits and pieces and the bits and pieces became rather large bits and rather large pieces. My father has really left a legacy in downtown Salt Lake. His commitment to historical preservation is here. It's present here and uh, those things uh, are available for generations to enjoy and participate in. As one of his sons, um, it brings great pleasure to be able to work on this project, something that he was inspired about uh, in his career early on that has actually been passed through our family to my brothers and I. Um, the joy to be able to, you know, to work on something that my dad did and to be able to make it have uh, a longer life and, you know, to really be better than it was initially is really special to us. And we hope that that legacy will not only pass to our families, but will also pass to our employees and their families and the people in the community as well. I think this project's been really special to me and for several reasons, but the most important is for my family and for my, my children and their children, for them to have something that they can look back and say, you know, Grandpa had a part of this, Grandpa was, was down here working on this building. I think it will add extra value to, to them particularly, but um, really to everyone that's worked on this project, I think it's going to be the same. Cast iron is just so big and expensive. I don't expect to see anybody building new cast iron buildings in America anytime soon, which makes the uh, stock of cast iron buildings that we have an especially precious resource. And it's timeless. It'll never grow old or out of style. 
So that's what the ZCMI facade says to me. It rewards you for looking. So the closer you walk to it, and the more closely you look at it, the more it visually rewards you. When we saw them, what they had done with it, it was almost like a miracle. They made something old, beautiful, turn into something new and elegant. I was so stunned because I wasn't expecting it um, and so awestruck by its beauty that I actually just stopped in my tracks and started to cry. I thought it was just such an astonishing sight to behold and it was, it just was so beautiful and you could tell even from diagonally a block across from it the, the kind of care and craftsmanship that went into the restoration. And I think I cried because I was, I just felt like we made the right decision, the community made the right decision and that that block was really gonna come back to all, not to its old glory, but to a new glory. You have this wonderful sense of historical continuity and this wonderful sense of visual celebration of ornamentation of detail. In a sense, the ZCMI uh, cast iron facade is, is like a wonderful painting. That uh, while our walls may change, our house may change, you save the painting and you keep using it because it has meaning to you.
well, an amazing building, an amazing, uh, amazing project, which has uh, really been a fascinating uh, journey to, to actually see happen. Uh, in the beginning of my presentation, I talked about a red thread, and little did I know when I was a 12-year-old boy working on an archaeological dig uh, with my dad that I would end up spending an entire career in preservation. I've completed now 44 years of working on old buildings. Um, I did a presentation, oh, probably four or five years ago, and, and I shared an experience about when I was a young man, and uh, I had the opportunity to excavate a well uh, where the Nauvoo Temple stands in Nauvoo, Illinois. And the only reason I got to do it was because I was small enough to be lowered down in a bucket <laughs> with a trowel. And um, I was able to dig some old artifacts out of that well and bring them up out of that site. And that magic of that experience uh, has stuck with me my entire career. Um, no business or industry uh, starts with any one person. And Paul Monson, you know, shared praises of me, but really the praises need to go to uh, my partners, uh, my brothers, all those who work with us, and all of those who have influenced us in this community. This community has been an amazing place to foster uh, artisanship and craftsmanship, and there's been a place here for us to do what we do. We, we love this community. It's interesting that people have flown to Salt Lake from all over the world to look at ZCMI and to study it. Um, I just completed the restoration of the dome on the U.S. Capitol. Uh, the dome was, is cast iron. It was cast in 1855, from 1855 to 1863. 1866 actually it was completed. But um, that red thread that took me from the bottom of a well in Nauvoo led me to the top of a dome. And it's been an amazing, amazing experience. Um, that's a whole nother story on its, on its own. But uh, anyway, what I'd like to do is just turn some time over to you, let you ask some questions about this project, uh, if you have any questions about preservation. Um, yes? Robert, there's, there's some additional historical information you might be interested in. Um, the, uh, the building, although ZCMI was founded in 68, 69, the building, the central seven bay section, which was the first section, wasn't built until 1876. And it had an architect. It was uh, Obed Taylor, who was a uh, Mormon convert from San Francisco, uh, converted by Parley P. Pratt in 1855. And then he came to Salt Lake in 1871 and became a partner with William Folsom, the architect of the Manti Temple. And uh, newspaper accounts say that Obed Taylor drew the plans, designed the building for the original Museum I in 1876, and it was built by uh, Elias Morris, who was the leading building contractor in Utah at the time. He did the Templeton building, <coughs> he showed a picture of being destroyed, and uh, he actually fell down the elevator shaft during the construction and died, died uh, as a result of that accident. But Morris himself was a, a architect builder too. And then the southern wing was built only four years later in 1880, another architect, and then the northern wing was <coughs> three bays, I think, even after that. And uh, the, the oldest cast iron building actually on the street is the uh, Hussey Bank, the First National Bank, which was that white painted cast iron building next to Lamb's Cafe. That's about 161 South Main, and that was designed by Richard Upjohn, uh, America's uh, leading uh, Gothic architect. He's the one who founded the American Institute of Architects in 1857. But the first restoration of the Zeke's and Mike storefront was actually by Richard Klenning, the state capital architect, who did it in 1904. And he, he was hired to do restoration and modification of the storefront back uh, in 1904. 
So there were architects uh, involved as well as builders, and additions and remodelings and restorations even over 100 years ago. So it's, it's been a very revered building, really, from, from day one. Uh, <laughs> congratulations to you and your group for what you did. Thanks. I appreciate that, Alan. I really enjoy those comments. It's fun. You know, we've got somebody here that knows a lot more about architectural history in Utah than I do, and uh, I really appreciate that. It's, it's great to hear, um, hear those insights, and I wish I would have known that when we were putting this film together. So, <laughs> good. I'm glad you've written some notes for me. Um, Anyway, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, yes? What were the, say, three biggest challenges from the two restorations that the company was involved in? Well, it's, it's interesting. You very rarely get an opportunity to work on a building twice and actually do a, a restoration twice. Um, in 1974, uh, 75 when the first restoration was done. Of course my father had no experience with cast iron. Um, he uh, approached the project uh, like he did every preservation project. He just started looking at it very closely. Took it apart and learned what he could. Went to industry. Fortunately here in the state of Utah we have a really strong mining industry and we had a very strong foundry industry that was supported uh, because of that mining industry. So um, as he started to do his research and learn about casting iron, he had a great resource here. Uh, second and third generation pattern makers and foundrymen that had uh, worked in the state of Utah that helped him. Initially when the first restoration of the ZCMI facade was done, uh, the building was taken apart. There weren't a lot of skilled people to take it apart, it, but we knew that the building was put together in pieces. Um, my father, of course, was the architect and in charge of the project. I have two other brothers uh, that were involved. We helped with pieces of that. There were other manufacturers in Utah. Metals Manufacturing Company was involved in helping us um, reassemble components. Uh, like my brother said early on, we had this shop in my parents' garage that was uh, outfitted with my mother's brand new Kirby vacuum. <laughs> Ironically, when we made this film, I was talking to my mother about that and she said, oh, I'm still using that Kirby vacuum. And she went and got it. And it's, she's still using it today. Um, but uh, anyway, what we learned, uh, we learned in the very beginning that what it took to cast a building. We, we learned about uh, electrolysis and uh, how different metals work against each other. Um, we learned about shrinkage and how you can't just take an original part and cast a new part off of it because metal shrinks. Um, we learned about how to improve waterproofing um, all of the issues that related to cast iron. And essentially, with the restoration of ZCMI, which was really the first major cast iron restoration, there was, there was actually a major project done on the U.S. Capitol in 1960. And um, I just spent three years redoing a bunch of things that they did on the U.S. Capitol because they didn't really know what they were doing either. But what we learned, and with an, uh, an approach to improve on everything that we did after that, um, we learned about technologies and uh, how, to, you know, how to make things work and how to coordinate and organize work. Eventually, we built our own foundry and our own facility. Uh, we couldn't get a foundry to, to work on our time schedule because we were such a small player in the industry that we had to build our own foundry. That's been an amazing benefit to us today. Um, but when we got to do the restoration a second time, we, we learned a lot about things that we did wrong the first time. And I am uh, the kind of person that doesn't ever believe you have a complete education. Everything that you do, you'll learn something new. 
And it was a real blessing to be able to take the building apart for a second time, see what we did wrong, and improve it in the second restoration. I believe that that, that facade will stand easily for another 100, 150 years without needing work, just because of the modern technologies that are available uh, today. The real downfall to cast iron, there are basically two issues. One is water and the other is uh, structural movement. If something settles and something breaks and then water is introduced into the cast iron facade, it will begin to work on it. Uh, so we learned those two things. Um, the other thing that we learned from this project is you can really do anything if you set your mind to it. And uh, I just put that to test um, in a project in Washington, D.C. that I had no idea how we were going to take the U.S. Capitol apart and put it back together in two years. I had no idea. But we were able to do it. But we gained the confidence for that from the experience that we had that started here in Salt Lake. Anyway, hopefully that answered your question. Any other questions? Yes? In the beginning, there was no pediment on the top, and then there was a curved one, and then a... I think Alan could probably tell the evolution of that. Uh, we've seen that from historical photographs. I don't know when the uh, pediment that's on the building was actually introduced. Do you have any idea? Was it when the last extension was done the to the building? The building was remodeled half a dozen times, at least, and there were three or four different pediments. That, that curved one from 1876 only lasted a short time. That triangular one, I think, maybe maybe cladding was, was involved with that. Right. So one of the other things that happened as we discovered when we were taking the building apart the first time is through the renovations that Alan mentioned, there were things that were done. So originally the first pieces of the building were cast iron. But when the later renovations were done, they didn't, they didn't cast those additions. They actually made them out of repose. They were hand-formed sheet metal. And we took down a major section of the building that was just sheet metal that was all hand-formed. Today, a section of the ZCMI facade is on permanent exhibit in the National Building Museum in Washington, D.C. Um, because it was one of the premier examples of highly detailed ornamental sheet metal that was actually created here in Salt Lake because of the immigrants that had come to Utah that had that European training. So um, when the facade was actually restored, the sheet metal was uh, taken down and then new components were actually cast uh, in aluminum, which is a lighter material, uh, replicating the iron and uh, put back in its place. So the entire facade now is actually cast metal where when we took it down in the 70s, it wasn't all cast iron. Yes? So how do you approach the issue of kind of original material, right? Because over time, things are replaced, and you're restoring it. Kind of. at, at what point do you say, you know, this piece, we're going to recast it, or we're going to try and preserve this piece? And how right. Do you approach that? Well, it's, it's really interesting. Um, a lot of times it comes down to the client and cost. How much do they want to spend to do the project? So what we, what we consider a Class A restoration now would be put back in original materials, uh, upgrading all of the mechanical fasteners and the waterproofing. However, there are alternate materials that can be used and um, we, of all the alternate materials that are available today that can be used on cast iron, that people are using fiberglass and GFRP and all kinds of other products, really the only one that has withstood my career are cast aluminum components. And if they're painted properly, they look just like iron. Uh, they're a lot lighter, they're easier to install. But really, the, 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 that question has to be answered by the client's commitment to the project. In the U.S. Capitol, the idea with the restoration of the Capitol was we do not want to lose any historic fabric 
We want to save every single thing that we can, and we will only replace in like-kind material what has to be replaced. Uh, I was able to convince the architect of the Capitol that if we were going to replace in cast iron, we should melt down the old cast iron and put it into the new iron going back in the building. That way they could say that it's made with original material. And that was something that it was a battle, but after we talked about being green and made all of the case for it, it was easily approved. And quite honestly, of the you know, 60, 70,000 pounds of iron that I put back in the U.S. Capitol, all of it has original iron in it. And it was all put back in the same material. But that was the commitment of the owner. So, um, that's really where it goes. Yes? Do you have a sense, of, in terms of percentages, of what the you might have sought, what percentage is 19th century original castings, and what have, uh, what are 20th century, like, mm -hmm. 70s? Yeah, it's actually pretty well documented in our drawings. Um, Alan, the first section was cast in 1870, 1876. I believe it was cast in Philadelphia, shipped by rail to Utah. Um, most of the big foundries in the United States were on the East Coast at that time. There were foundries here, and I think they were casting in small quantities, but most of the architectural foundries were between, really the industry started in New York City and then spread up and down the East Coast. But in the building, uh, that first section, which was cast iron, I would say probably over 65% is original out of the... Um, and then on the next bays, on the end that were cast iron, I would say easily 65 to 70%. And then on the north side where the uh, sheet metal was, that's relatively all new. But one of the things that we tried to do, and we were pretty meticulous, was to save every single, every single piece we could put back on the building we wanted to put on the building. So, yes? Um, I've, seen, I've seen this facade um, used nationally as an example of poor preservation. Mm -hmm. Like an example, this is not how it should be done. Um, In what regards? Well, in, in the regards that it's, uh, it's a facade based on a new building. Right. And so, um, obviously, here, like the, the restoration of the actual facade itself, the ironwork, is just amazing. Um, and yet, nationally, I've seen it, you know, right. as an example, of this is poor preservation right here. Because the building was torn down, and it was protected. I agree, it was particularly bad, especially the 1970s, where it, it was it seemed so divorced from the building that it was attached right. to. Um, and then there's also the, there was also an issue, and I'm curious if you know about this, obviously the client had decided the building was going down, and it was only very interesting that there was public, this public pressure, you know, by customers who said they didn't want the facade to go, and so, and that's what pressured the, you, to, 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 to do to something. Hire, to hire your dad to, to do that. That's software. exactly right. So we're really lucky that that happened. But one of the things that also happened is that the facade was changed. The arrangement of the facade was changed. It was changed from an asymmetrical design to a symmetrical design. Do you know why that was done? Was that also I don't. by the client? I have no, I, I so have what no you, idea. What you, see there, what you see there now is it's the creation a, of the 1970s. It's not, it does not reflect mm. the historic right. configuration of the facade. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm curious how that decision was made. If it was just somebody just was uneasy with that asymmetry. Right. And you know, it's, it, preservation has been really an interesting thing, as, and particularly as I've seen it through my career. You get a project like this, it's one of the first ones on the street, and it's, you learn a lot from it. And I would agree 100% that I would never pull a facade down like this and put it on the mall like it was, it was built then. But I also realize that um, we were trying to discover how to do things. People, you know, people were, there was, I think what was done was 
done at a budget and under a lot of pressure. So, um, yeah, I guess my follow-up question would be: Do you think that um, that the preservation community? I'm not sure if in Utah if we've learned anything from that, but I wonder if nationally there's been some learning where where that wouldn't happen, where that wouldn't happen today. We're lucky to have that facade, but I wonder today if the decision were made if some of the original building would. I actually think if we were starting at ground zero with the knowledge that we have in this community, there would have been a different approach. The actual master plan for the restoration of the facade was to save 20 feet into the store and have the existing historical store. And that. Robert or